Lakeshore Drive with Gerard McClendon. Well, ladies and gentlemen, today we have someone very, very special. But then again, everybody that comes on the show is very special. We have Emmy winner Dr. Gerard McClendon. Gerard, how are you doing today? It's a blessed day. It's a wonderful day. I'm doing fantastic, man. It, it, it could not be better. Well, myself and Yash are really thrilled to have you here today. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. It's a real honor and privilege to uh, have you here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the feeling is likewise. <laughs> well, I'm just going to jump right into it. So, Gerard, I would like to start our show before we get into the meat of the potatoes. Would you mind introducing yourself to my younger listeners who may not know who you are. Well, you know, Gerard McLennan is the name, but, uh, you know, I'm, I am first and foremost a teacher. I'm a, I'm a didactic person. I'm one who teaches. Uh, when I was eight years old, I realized that I had the gift of teaching, of uh, disseminating knowledge in a, in a very uh, practical way, being able to explain difficult things in a very simplistic way. And so uh, um, the, the teaching profession kept calling me uh, when I was 13 and 15 and 19. And, and I was denying it. Ah, I don't want to be a teacher. I don't want to be a professor. <laughs> but it kept calling me. And sometimes, man, when you get that calling, you have to make sure that you answer that call. And so even though I've done media, you know, I've done, you know, two talk shows for PBS, one talk show for CLTV, WGN, and, you know, we've won Emmy Awards, and, you know, I'm a professor and PhD and all that. The heart of the matter, man, I'm a teacher. That's what I do. Uh, that's what God put me on this planet to do, to give people information and to be able to uh, triangulate it and make sure that it can be edifying to those that I give that information to. Mm. 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 Yash? Very interesting. I see you uh, You were born in Hammond, Indiana. Oh, man. Correct. Back in the day. <laughs> yes. Back in the day, man. You know, the, the Hammond, Indiana, also known as... Uh, uh, Steel City, also known as Railroad City, also known as the H, the M, the D. Hammond, Indiana. <laughs> man. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sitting right between Chicago and East Chicago and Gary, Indiana. It's right right, it's right, right there. there. It's right in the middle, man. Yes, sir. <laughs> right there. As my friends would say, you live you live in Indiana. I said, not quite, but I'm right on the border. That's right. Um, so you uh, you were born there. You so born and raised. You went to high school in uh in Hammond? Born and raised. Um, Bethany Child Care was my first school. Lou Wallace mm -hmm. Elementary was my elementary school. Lou Wallace. Edison okay. Middle School. And then Hammond High School was my high school. Then I went to Wabash College, Valparaiso, and Loyola. Yeah, but Hammond, <laughs> that's my stomping grounds. Man, I was in Hammond earlier today, which was, in which was interesting, just going up up and down some of the streets, man. I had dropped mm -hmm. my wife off at an event, and uh, I said, "While she's at the event, let me just let me just crawl through some of these streets that I used to hang out on, man. Kenwood, Moss Street, Cleveland, Drackert. Yeah, I was over there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then Wabash College. What was what was that experience like? Oh man, Wabash College, man. Private, all male. So oh, wow. Private really? all male, yeah, private all male college in central Indiana, predominantly white. Uh, very wealthy people go there. Um, interesting experience, man. Wabash College is one of three all male colleges in the country today. Of course, mm -hmm. more Morehouse in Atlanta, uh, mm -hmm. and then Hamden, Sydney. And Wabash College, man, uh, it's only three all-male co college campuses uh, in the United States. And so, yeah, went to that school, man, and 
Uh, of course, when you get to Wabash and you're one of few black people there and there's no women there, you know, it's uh, it's culture shock. Right. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but that's where my mother wanted me to go. And um, uh, it was uh, a place to really get a great education, man. I mean, you know, from from African literature to the Greek and English classics, you know, uh, it was all there at Wabash College. You know, it is, here's the crazy thing. It's a predominantly white institution. It's private. Uh, it's wealthy. And lo and behold, the students in 1971 started a Malcolm X Institute at a Lily White U University. Mm. Is that a truth? Really? So it just shows you the consciousness. Yeah. In fact, this is our, wow, we're celebrating like our 50th year this year. We couldn't have it two years ago because of the pandemic. So, right. 20, so 2022 marks the 50th year for, for the Malcolm X Institute. So we're, uh, we're happy. We're That's happy. so progressive. Extremely, extremely. Yeah. But, but, that, pro, but that, that progress came out of an interesting time. When you look at the late 60s and early 70s, that was the time when a lot of college, it was, it, it was, it was horrible for black people at that time. But at the same mm -hmm. time, if you wanted to go to college between like 68, when King got died, died, uh, got shot all the way up to like 1975, that was the time to go to college because of white guilt. Mm. Right. And the right. money, the money was flowing at that time. It's yes. like, you know, we just better give black people scholarships or else this country is gonna <laughs> this country's gonna burn down. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so even though I went to Wabash College in the 80s and 90s, I benefited from that by having access to the Malcolm X Institute, man. So even though I was in a, a lily white, wealthy, all-male environment, I still got the opportunity to be pro-black. Yeah. Mm -hmm. wow. So would you say that your mother and father inspired you to get into educational policy? Oh, man, <laughs> most definitely. My parents were strong advocates of education and policy. Uh, my mom worked for Illinois Bell and my dad was a postal worker and they never went to college, but they made sure that their three sons would go. And they would, you know, when we were little, they would take us on these extravagant vacations. And it, what's weird is they would, we would go on these vacations and have fun, but they were always in very influential college towns. <laughs> you know, so when we went to DC, we would hit the DC universities. It's like, why? Mm -hmm. are, you know, I'm I'm ten years old. Why am I? Why am I on Howard's campus? <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, when we went to Colorado, you know, and you know, we're think we we're thinking we're in Colorado Springs and in Denver, you know, to ride the cable cars and to see snow caps and things like that. Oh, it's mm -hmm. Mile High City. No, nah, it's like. Then we end up on the campus of the Air Force Academy, you know, mm, and so my, wow. my parents were planting those seeds, man, when we were young without saying a word, you know, mm. and that's the brilliance of a parent, man, the parent and the grandparent and like your mm. uncles and aunts, those sounds people, like somebody I know. Yeah, that, <laughs> that tribe, that tribe is so, and people don't realize, man, that tribe is so important, man, you know, um, the, the, there's there's three people in your life that will probably die for you, okay? Three people, that's mm -hmm. it, that's it. There's 12 people that are in your closest tribe. They can be family members or not, but there's 12 people that will, that will ride for you, okay? And then your larger tribe is about 125 people. That's about the number of people that'll come to your funeral, right? But mm. but when it comes to, to when it comes to that that two to three people that will die for you, those are the people that when you call at three in the morning, they'll come pick you up off the expressway. Those right. two or those two or three people are the people that will loan you a thousand dollars without asking a question. Okay, right. those two or three people are the people that know your children's middle names. Right, mm. right. Mm. So when people say, "Oh, I got five thousand Facebook friends," no, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> you, you got 5,000 people that just click follow, <laughs> you yep. know, and yep. so the key, the key, Dantes, the key 
Mr. Slaughter, is to take care of your tribe. Mm. So those three ride or die people, buy them gifts. Remember their birthday, right? Mm. You know, mm. uh, uh, call them once a week or once a month. Say, I love you. I'm just calling you to say, I love you. Do you need anything? Those 12 people, you want to take care of them as well. Don't forget their birthday. Send them a card. Be nice to them. Take them out to dinner occasionally. You take care of the tribe. See, everybody want a million followers. Take care of 12 followers. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Take care yeah. of 100. There's a great book by uh, Seth Godin called Tribes. And Seth Godin goes in on that. He leans in heavy on that. He's like the 125 people that are in your tribe. He said, you treat them like gold. And what happens is when you treat people well, you get it back exponentially. It's That's unbelievable. True. I mean, yes. it could be a favor. It could be, you know, uh, I talk about mentors, coaches, and sponsors. Like I'm like, like a coach is a person that sees you day to day, right? Okay, that's my coach. Okay, LeBron needs a coach. Jordan needs a coach. Tiger Woods needs a coach. Venus and Serena needed a coach. You see a coach every day. They're teaching you to craft, right? Your mentor, mm -hmm. you don't need to see your mentor every day. Your mentor, you can see once a week, once a month, once every six months. Your mentor is guiding you. Okay, man, try that. Oh, read this book. Uh, you know what? You need to look at just you need to get on some boards, uh, some, you know, some executive boards. Do this. Your mentor is, is kind of a cloud mentor, kind of a cloud person, kind of looking down on you saying, hey, go there. Don't go there. OK, fork in the road now. Uh, but see, here's the thing. People know what a coach and a, and a mentor is, but they ignore sponsors. Hmm. That's hmm. what you want. See, that sponsor is a person you may never talk to at all. A sponsor is a person that may talk to you once in every five years, but a sponsor can say your name and get you a job. Your, mm. your sponsor can call somebody and say, you know what, uh, Dantes and Mr. Slaughter need, uh, you know, $50,000 uh, uh, grant for blah, 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 for their media, um, for their media, you know, desires. A sponsor can get on the phone and make that call. And I think we focus on mentoring and coaching, but the key is to get a, you don't need 20 sponsors. You just need one. And, and I don't think people focus on that sponsor enough. Now, the thing with a sponsor, though, is you don't go around asking people to sponsor you. You have to develop a relationship with a millionaire or with an executive director or with someone who's got mass influence and power. You know, a good friend of mine owns 40 McDonald's restaurants. He's a he's he's a sponsor of mine. And yeah. pretty much anything I ask for, this sponsor will give me. But here's the thing. Sponsors, they pretty much know what you need and what you want, so you never have to ask. Right. <laughs> you yeah. know, my, yeah. spon my sponsor is, uh, uh, is Roland Parrish, you know, from uh, Roland G. Parrish uh, Foods in, in Dallas, Texas. You know, okay. uh, I'll never forget the day when Roland said, Gerard, I had a bad year. I said, you had a bad year. He said, yeah, I only made I only made 30 million. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't perspective interesting, gentlemen? Very, very yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a bad year. I said, really? How's it been lately? Oh, things have been good lately. I'm making about 62 million a year now. See, so so it's so this is the kind of person that you want in your atmosphere, in your orbit. You know, uh, one or two sponsors, you know, maybe three or four mentors. And then, you know, th all throughout our lives, we have coaches. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, right. I couldn't agree more with that. Well, Gerard, so I have to ask now because I, I like I, I, I'm giving my age away now, but I remember watching Gerard McClendon fired up. Mm. And I don't remember if that was. 03 or 04, mm -hmm. somewhere in there, possibly. How did that start? Oh, uh, what man. was the mechanics behind that? How did that how did that start? That's a great question. And let me tell you <laughs> why. It, it, it's a great question because this is a story that I love to tell. I'll start off by saying this. 
people have to get on their grind. Now, that doesn't just mean working hard and waking up early and working to midnight. Uh-uh. Know what you want and go after it, regardless of the circumstances. So I knew that I was a teacher, a very successful one. But I knew that my classroom would only get bigger if I was in some sort of media atmosphere, right? <laughs> so... um. There was a lady, when I was living in Indianapolis, there was a, this was right before my first teaching job, I think. There was a lady on a bus. I was on the bus with her. I did not know this lady, gentlemen. This lady says to me, she said, young man, she said, I don't know who you are, but she said, you're going to get paid for every word you write and every word you say. Mm. Never saw that woman again in my life. And it hit me then. Later on, I met another woman. Like five years later, I met another woman at Apostolic Church of God. I'll never forget this. She didn't know me because Apostolic's a big church, right? She didn't know me. But she said, young man, she said, you have to increase the size of your classroom. Now, she didn't even know I was a teacher. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And so at the moment, I didn't know what she meant. Then it hit me. I said, oh, wow. When I teach, I'm only teaching 20, 30, 40 people at a time. You know, um, on the university level, each semester, I only have maybe 80 to 100 students. She mm. meant, she meant everywhere is biblical. Everywhere you set your feet, that's your territory. She, mm. she basically was saying, Continue to teach, but make your audience bigger by getting into media. So this is where I answer your question. In 1999, I started doing a show on the radio in Hammond, Indiana, WJOB. And that show got popular. The show got so popular that someone at Comcast said, why don't you do a TV show in Merrillville, Indiana? All right. So I started doing a TV show in Maryville, Indiana from 2000 to 2004 uh, called The Big Picture with my brother. So I'm doing that show and then I start doing hits on WGN, CLTV, WVON, on Fox News. I start doing hits because the word got out. Oh, it's this McClendon dude. He talks about education and he talks about deconstructing education. And he talks about the you know, philosophical aspects of policy and education and how it relates to the, you know, to the disintegration of black people. This guy is interesting. All right. So I'm running my mouth, running my mouth. I start sending demo tapes out and lo and behold, I get a call from WGN CLTV and they said we we're, we're thinking about some ideas I don't know what they were thinking about they said <laughs> we need you to come on the show and just talk I said okay so they wanted me to come on a show to talk about the R. Kelly trial the first trial Oh my goodness, back, I remember that. Back, yep, back in the 2000s. In fact, you can still find it on YouTube today. Yes. Man, they start asking me questions and and they were taking phone calls. So I'm basically mm. saying, I'm basically just, mm. just I'm, I'm ripping R. Kelly, right? Mm. And these callers start calling in and they're like, how dare you say that? Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so I'm defending myself and I'm defending the young ladies who had gone through all this trauma. And, mm. uh, and then that show ended. And then all of a sudden, about a week later, the programmer at CLTV WGN said, we need you to drive to Chicago or Oak Brook. I said, sure. I drive, I walk in. They said, we want to give you a show. Wow. 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 So wow. see, you never know who you're looking at. That's why you all, Oprah Winfrey taught me this when I, man, I tell you, see, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good friends with Yala Van Zandt. Mm -hmm. and, okay. And, and, and so, and so, and I mean, she and I go way back. And so, so I'll never forget this. When, when Yala Van Zandt introduced me to Oprah Winfrey, Oprah Winfrey said, always be ready, Gerard. Mm. She said, when, and, and this was a time when people dressed up. She said, when you go to the grocery store, she said, dress up. 
you don't know who you're going to run into. That's so true. Yeah, she said, you got to be ready. She says, because the person who you think isn't important might be the person that writes the million dollar check for you. And she said, what Oprah told you. Yep. She said, be ready. Be ready. Don't, don't, you shouldn't have to get ready. No, be ready. And how do you, how are you ready? You're ready by working on your craft constantly. You got to constantly work on your craft, man. You know, you got to Steph Curry this thing. It shouldn't be any different than LeBron or Steph Curry and what you're doing in your own career. Mm -hmm. How does Steph drop so many three pointers? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. How does Jordan hit free throws after being fouled? How does how does Michael Jordan hit free throws in the fourth quarter after being tired with the flu and being fouled for three quarters? How does he hit free throws in the fourth quarter by getting up at six in the morning in the gym shooting 500 free throws? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. but it's about sacrifice, man. How bad do you want it? How bad do you really want it? Well, we certainly both can attest to uh, sacrifices, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the things that I always remembered about uh, Gerard McClendon fired up is you had a call-in number. And that was very unique for that format at the time. You know, uh, it was it was almost revolutionary. Did you have uh, a hand in developing that or did you just did it just happen? It, it was organic. You know, when they hired me, they said, we want you to do a show. And I said, well, what kind of show? They said, it's a daily show. It's not weekly. I said, okay, that's cool. I said, is it taped? They said, no, it's live. Mm. I said, oh, yeah. I said, <laughs> I said, that's my cup of tea right there. I said, but people don't, people don't just want to hear Gerard running his mouth. People don't want to just see news stories. People want to mm. see Gerard's opinion and what his guests think and they want to know what the hottest news story is of the day. But if he has the phone lines open, oh, everybody can be a player. That's the beauty of the show. Um, it's so sad that there aren't more shows like that show. You know, because TV is one way, man. Even most yeah. internet communication is one way. Radio mm -hmm. is one way, but when you get that two way going, it's a conversation, man. It's a dance, mm -hmm. you know, it's a dance. It's like, okay, now we have to think, you know, if I'm watching a program, they're doing the thinking for me, but if I can call, <laughs> but if I can call a show, oh my God, now everybody has to think. Right, right, mm -hmm. right. So what inspired off 63rd one of my favorite things about off 63rd it was everything that made gerard mcclendon live great but a little bit more raw and organic i enjoyed watching you uh walk through the streets and uh blend in was that the the feeling that you wanted to give when 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 you were doing those segments yeah, Off 63rd was, uh, was of course, after uh, Gerard, the Gerard McClendon show. Off 63rd with Gerard McClendon was so cool because because it, it gave, I had more constraints on the show because it was PBS, okay? It was public broadcasting. But at the same time, with PBS, there comes some freedoms, okay? Um, sometimes your budget can be bigger. Uh, sometimes you have more access to guests that are more national or international. And so with Off 63rd, From the Beach to the Burbs, yes, we were focusing on Chicago. We shot that, sh we shot that show from WYCC, from Kennedy King's TV studios. And oh, I didn't know that. I did not know that. It's so funny because when you watch <laughs> the episodes of Off 63rd on YouTube, I tell people, I say, that's Kennedy King. People are like, that's not Kennedy King. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't think that was, I saw some comments, but I just didn't believe it. Yeah. That's Kennedy King, man. You know, and it's about, you know, having high production standards and you know, that's, yeah. that's that off 63rd show was hot because we really got to delve into the aspect of uh, what are Chicago's influentials really thinking and talking about. That was the beauty of that show. And 
the show that we did called The Challenge of Raising African American Boys, that show was the show that won the Emmy for us. And I, I, I do remember watching that. I do remember yeah. watching that. Yeah, that do show remember. was hot. That show was hot, you know. This is Gerard McClendon, and it has been more than an honor to be on Access Lakeshore Drive. And, uh, and and that show was dedicated to just all of the people out there, man, that are having a very hard time, man, raising black boys, man, because it's tough. It's a full-time job. It is definitely a full-time job. Uh, Yash, uh, I'm going to throw Yash under the bus here, but at one point, Yash used to look at the 12 at one time. Wow. <laughs> wow. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Well, you probably have to explain that. Uh, but anyway, well, you're right. a small world. I don't know. You you Chicago State affiliated. Uh, you so you, you are you there now currently? Yeah, I'm there now. I'm there now. I've been a professor at Chicago State since uh, 2011. And my mother-in-law, my ex-mother-in-law, uh, ran the copying department. Her name was Miss Willoughby, Mary Willoughby. Mm. I don't know if you know her or not. I'm sure I've run into her. Right. Before. Wow, she ran, She was like Chicago State's number one um, basketball fan. She was oh. like the basketball mom, and she was a head of duplicating services. Retired about maybe it was over ten years ago, but I spent a lot of time on that campus, and uh, I was I was really happy when they uh, you know built that library and oh, yeah. you know started upgrading the uh, upgrading the uh, facilities at the university, and uh, you know. Um, and, and a lot of people probably don't know, younger people don't know that that used to be the teacher's college back in the day. That's right. And, and, I, and I know this because I, I attended the Chicago vocation. I went to CVS. Yes. And uh, all my teachers attended that. Uh, they said the teacher's college. I'm like, where was that? It was like, you know, Chicago State. I was like, is that what they were? Yep. So the majority of my teachers were from there. So that's the little tidbit from uh, Chicago history. That's right. Chicago Teachers College, man. 1867, yeah. man. Born in a railroad car, brother. Yep. Yeah, man. <laughs> it's the bottom line, man. You know, my shoot, I got cousins. I've got aunts that went to Chicago Teachers College. I mean, if you were, if you were a teacher, especially a black teacher, as well as white teachers in Chicago, that's, mm -hmm, probably, mm -hmm. that's, that's probably where you went. Mm -hmm. Majority of my teachers, black and white, were from there. Yep. Yes. Yeah. And uh, the position you hold there, are you on the board? Are you uh, a uh, you know a professor? Yes, I'm in the Department of Advanced Studies and Education. Okay. Uh, I teach uh, educational policy. I teach school law, school finance, and curriculum okay. and development. And uh, yep, I'm in the College of Education, man, right on the uh, southernmost point of the school. And uh, in fact, we just built a child care center in our building and we just built a brand new playground uh, on our uh, facility on the south side. Right. of the campus. So that's great. We're excited, we're excited, man. We're excited. Yeah. Well, well, Dr. Axe or Ask, mm -hmm. great book, by the way. I have to ask now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How important is it to master the English language as African-Americans? Oh, man. So Go ahead. So many of our youth today really lack proper writing and grammar skills due to the overusing of text shorthand. How do we correct that? So if you're from a wealthy family or if you're, you know, you got millionaire, billionaire status, you know, language isn't really important at all. Right. Uh, because you already have the means and the power uh, to not be exploited right uh, but if you are trying to obtain education and if you are trying to move to a, a level of, uh, uh, of trying to move out of a level of economic exploitation and you're trying to not be exploited and not be taken advantage of you probably need to have a good command of the English language that's why I wrote that book when I was when I was teaching at Culver Military Academy I noticed that a lot of the African American students you know came to such a prestigious institution but didn't have good facility with the language and I said okay there's a way to correct this and uh, I kept complaining about it but I said okay since I'm the main one around here complaining let me write a book about it 
So that's, mm. that's that's where Axe or Ask was born, man. Axe or Ask, the African American guide to better English. And uh, you know, I believe that you know when you increase your vocabulary, when you have facility with the language, when you can code switch and move in and out of your neighborhood, uh, linguistically as well as into um, an academic scenario linguistically that's when you have the mastery of code switching you know so and, true and when you can code switch man you can do almost anything man. that, it doesn't, that is it, so it, true and code switching doesn't mean selling out people are oh, you're a seller no. it has nothing to do with that man code switching is just a way to not become prey or a way to become a predator that's all. That is so I mean, true. You know, I, you know, some salamanders, you know, you know, uh, some some lizards can change color. They do it. Why? They do it to, to survive. That's right. It's survival, man. That's all. It's survival. That is so true. I have uh, two children and uh, ironically, one of my uh, my son is a, a recent graduate of Morehouse uh, mm. last year. So I I always congratulations. Taught my, thank you. Thank you. I always taught my kids that, you know, hey, I'm, I'm you know, the versatility is a great piece. You can be, I can be in the hood and I can relate and, 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 and talk to the people in the hood. And I also can go talk to the president, CEO of a company and, and know, how, know how to articulate and enunciate, you know, my words and, and relate with him. So, mm -hmm. you know, I always kind of prided myself on that versatility, just what you were just explaining. Absolutely. And see, code switching, <clears throat> thank you for saying that because code switching really is no different than having multiple skills in one discipline so like okay we know that steph can hit the three right we know mm -hmm. that Le we know that lebron can dunk right but they both have to dribble yeah what if steph curry and lebron couldn't dribble they would not be great <laughs> you see what i'm saying so they have to yeah. code switch how do i get open i have to move with and without oh. the ball if i have the ball i have to dribble Right. And yeah. so it's the kind of thing where that's how we view language, man. Language. Look, man, if we could only get our people, this is really I'm really preaching to everybody here. But if we could only get children to read 20 minutes a day of whatever they want to read, mm -hmm. you'll read over a million words a year. That right there will increase your vocabulary. You know, and there are psychologists as well as linguists that right discuss this. It says black SAT verbal scores are lower because they're reading fewer words before the age of seven. Mm. Has nothing to do with intelligence. You're just reading fewer words. <laughs> yeah. That's basic, yeah. dude. That's simple. That's simple, yeah. man. Very simple. You know, and it's funny as we as we sit here and talk about this. I'm actually being transported back to uh, Maryville Academy, and one of the things that uh, I am most grateful for is when we got into trouble, we would have to sit down and write specific words over and over and over, mm. and we would have to do. Pages and pages and pages and pages and pages of that. And it was like having college before I went to college. And I share that with 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 Yash all the time. Um, you know, the the punishments that we faced, you know, at Maryville were always based around vocabulary, <laughs> um, math. I still hate math to this day, but. You know, uh, <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, uh, you know, but English specifically, you know, that was something that, you know, we were taught and, and were really, really expected to understand because of of the task sheets. And that's what they were called. Um, so every time, you know, we talked back, we did, you know, up. Oh, you know, Don says you need to go get 12 task pages. Oh, man, I got to go get 12 task pages. <laughs> you, you know, so couldn't agree more with you. Couldn't agree more with you. And I, I just wish that, um, you know, our children's parents would just be a little bit more creative with, you know, sentencing as punishment, you know, mm. uh, taking away televisions. And uh, I think I might have actually been the last generation who got their TVs taken out of their room, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you know, and having a book placed in my face. So I couldn't agree more with you, you know, couldn't agree more with you. So I want to talk a little bit about my favorite book of yours. 
And I'm not lying when I say I purchased a copy of this long before, you know, I interacted with you. Tell me about the scholarly works of Dr. Donda West. Oh, I man. know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know you have some interesting tidbits about this. Man, that's my heart, Donda West, man. Wow. I mean, man, Donda West, man. What? Donda Claran Williams West. I, I mm. It's emotional to me, man, because... Uh, I met her years ago. Of course, she was a professor at Chicago State for 22 mm -hmm. years in the English department. Mm -hmm. She was an amazing poet, uh, linguist, literature teacher, and, uh, you know, artist. And it it's the kind of thing where it's close to my heart because I saw early, because I, I remember Kanye before he was Kanye. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. we're talking mid '90s, man. You know, when when you know before college dropout and all that that hit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Donda West was this scholar at Chicago State who was just doing miraculous things, you know, and writing these beaut this beautiful prose, man, and these amazing scholarly documents. And I and I said, I said, okay, everybody pays attention to Kanye, obviously, because he's an international star, right? You know, mm -hmm. you know multiple Grammys. Uh, he's a household name. But I said, it's something about Donda West, and we see that in the documentary, Genius. Mm -hmm. It's something about Donda West that creates Kanye West, you know? And so when you look at how literate she was and how, how sensitive she was, I said, it's something about... And so we started digging up her scholarly works. And at Chicago State, I put together a class called Introduction to Teaching, Philosophy of Teaching. And I had my students find everything that Donda West wrote. Do you know that my students found over 300 documents and recordings in six months? Wow. It was just un prolific. Oh, just just and and the world had never known this, you know. And of course, I couldn't put everything in the book because it would just been too much, too much text. But uh, the woman was astounding. Uh, I had met her on occasion at I met her in the Chicago State Library years ago, and I said somebody should publish your works, and she said Gerard, why don't you publish them? <laughs> man so so i didn't think nothing of it i was just kind of taken aback actually i was like why should i publish them you know and, and of course you know her untimely passing man she passes away man and i'm like mm -hmm. oh my god that woman told me to publish her works man so in 2012 we got busy on it and uh and then um you know a few years ago man we published the book man uh donda's rules the scholarly documents of Dr. Donda West, mother of Kanye West. There's 70 rules on writing composition that Donda West created. And that's uh, mm. that's all in the book, man. You know, that's all in the book. I mean, Kanye got it from her first, man, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So do you think that uh, most of Kanye's lyrical genius comes from a mixture of what's going on in the street and the intellectual academic side? Yeah, yeah. I think your answer to that within the question is yes, yes, and yes. I hmm. think Don Don DeWest becomes the chief contributor. I think Kanye's own genius, what he was born with, is a contributor. And I think that being born in Atlanta and being raised on the south side of Chicago is also a contributor. You know, uh, uh, lest we forget, Kanye spent about a year in China. He was in the Nanjing province in China when Dr. Donda West was a Fulbright scholar. Mm -hmm. And the, the Chinese wanted Donda West to come to uh, China to talk about American literature. So Kanye, very few people know this, man. Kanye knows Mandarin and Cantonese, man. The brother, mm -hmm. the brother deep. See, people people think Kanye is just this, this popular figure that gets a news story every day. Man, it's way beyond that, man. The brother's so deep. You know, I spent five days with him last year, last summer, and I got to see him work. And the, the work ethic of that man is phenomenal. 
You know, I got to see him work on Gap clothing. I got to see him work on Adidas Yeezys. You know, I got mm -hmm. to work on music. I got to see him work on, you know, uh, new forms of fashion. And mm -hmm. I got to see him, you know, and he brought me out to California to explain his mother's educational philosophy to him and to his staff so he could open the schools and so that we could put the And I love the fact that he did that. That's right. You know, uh, we have the Don to West curriculum in five schools now, and uh, uh, two of the schools are, of course, Donda Academy and Yeezy Christian Academy. So mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're proud of that work and we're just glad that, you know, uh, and, you know, Kanye, Kanye Omari, you know, why does she name him Kanye Omari? It means the only one, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and so mm -hmm. uh, sad, man, sad to see her go. Uh, some things in life are unfortunate, but uh, but we press on. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So that actually brings me to my next topic, Forgiving Cain, um, the, your documentary. How difficult was it to create and forgive at the same time? It is a brilliant piece of community activism. Mm -hmm. Most deaf, most deaf. You know, uh, I've been thinking about this for a long time, and when it hits home, you know, you see friends murdered or family members or relatives you know, uh, succumb to gun violence. Uh, you hear about people being murdered. We see it on the news every day. Uh, but we become desensitized until it happens to you, right? You know, so mm -hmm. 2009, you know, I'm doing a TV show, man. I get interrupted uh, while I'm writing script that, uh, you know, uh, my parents were the ones who were murdered and found in the forest preserve. You know, and so it's like, wait a minute. I talk about people being murdered on my show and then it comes to me. <laughs> mm -hmm. And my wife called the station, WGN. She said, come home right now. And of course, I'm a workaholic. So I'm like, what are you talking about? She's like, come home right now. She said, get out of there. So I gave the phone to my producer, Jerry Riles, and my wife tells Jerry Riles, and I said, Jerry, and then she, he hangs the phone up. I said, Jerry, what's going on, man? He said, come to the parking lot with me. So oh, I go to the parking lot, man, with my, my guy, Jerry Riles, man. And he says, man, he says, we didn't want to tell you in the newsroom, man. He says, man, the, the, the two, the elderly couple found in the Calumet City Forest Preserve were your parents, man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm still sorry to hear that. Oh, my God. I, thank you, brother. I mean, so my whole world, man, at that point was turned upside down, man. I mean, you know, um, you just can't believe it, man. You know, then a week later, we find out it's two African-American young men, 17, 18 years old, uh, new, newly initiated gangster disciples. Mm-hmm. Uh, had ABK on their uh, tattoos on their arms, anybody killer, you mm. know, uh, and, uh, you know, they arrested them, got the evidence. Year later, pleaded, uh, you know, they, they, they pled guilty. And, uh, it, you know, my parents being killed, yes, that's sad. Yes, we forgave them that day, you mm. know, uh, that it happened. Uh, but um, but that's sad. But the sad, but what's just as sad is you're 17 and 18 years old, and you 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 do a home invasion on an elderly couple, you know, and yeah. you go to jail for life, dude. They got 120 year sentences. Yeah. You know, and uh, and so yeah, that's sad, man. You know, it's it's uh, you know, but I say I got to turn it into something, so. I started interviewing people, man, you know, got them on film, interviewing Blair Holt's family, you mm, know. I remember that. Yeah, man, just just interviewing uh, uh, Harvey Johnson's family, interviewing um, um, Frankie Valencia's family, 
you know, interviewing Sheila A. Doyle's family, interviewing these families, man, who lost a loved one to gun violence. And then, you know, the documentary was born, man. You know, and what we try to do is show how senseless these killings are. You know, most folks killed, man, for $10, you know, $20, you know, a uh, joyride in a stolen car, in person killed. It's like, really? Really? You know, but uh, but that's what a murderer does, man. A murderer thinks that what you have is less important than killing you. Mm. <laughs> you know, and uh, and we say, OK, let's turn this thing around. We're going to we're going to write a story and do a documentary on these families who've lost a loved one to gun violence. And we're going to focus on their forgiveness and we're going to focus on what's on the horizon i mean they did it at eve they did it at mother emmanuel right mother emmanuel ame you know mm -hmm. you know dylan roof man shoots up the whole bible study you know at mother emmanuel mm -hmm. you know and really really he shoots up the bible study the families forgave him mm -hmm. Dylan Roof, man, that mur that white supremacist murderer, they forgave that guy, man, you know, and it shows you how insens insensitive the cops are. The cops took him to Burger King because he was hungry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. So that's the kind of world we live in right now, man. This world needs some joy, man. This world needs some joy. Some joy and and I'm telling you, yeah, that's what we need, man. You know, people got to start apologizing. People got to start looking at each other in the eye again, saying, "Hey, I love you. Uh, I support you. Uh, you know, I'm your ride or die. I'm here for you, man." Like human beings don't hear that, so then they, then they isolate themselves and then they become depressed and then they drink. They do drugs. They result to uh, possible suicide because they never were seen. That's why when you see a person, don't just say, hey, how you doing? Say, hey, I see you. Mm -hmm. I see you. What you need, brother? I see you. Let me buy you a cup of coffee. I see you. Oh, are oh, you in a restaurant? I see you. Hey, man, I got the check. I see you. Mm -hmm. That's all. That's really all people need. It's not. It's not. It's not worldly gain that's not really what people want man they think they want oh i'm a floss right you know i'm gonna show you my car yeah i'm gonna show you these i'm gonna show you this louis bag i got uh, no, people don't bet that's that's all surface people want to be seen man they want mm -hmm. to be acknowledged that's mm -hmm. really that's really it mm -hmm. affirmation yeah yeah so were you expecting the positive feedback that you got for forgiving cain yeah, yeah, I was expecting it. I mean, you know, you always gonna have haters, but you know, I was expecting it, man. I can't wait. Oh, Girardi did it again. Oh, yeah, it's gonna be released. <laughs> you know, we're gonna release that sometime uh, late summer, early fall. You know, on our uh, streaming networks, we'll also have uh, we'll also have the screenings probably at AMC Theater. So we're we're excited, man. We're excited. Oh, I'm excited. Yeah, well, hopefully we we can get some tickets to that. We oh, like that. Yeah, I have you on the list. Definitely. Great. Well, my last question, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to Yash. Now, do you think that education policy in 2022 takes into consideration, you know, some of the, you know, different challenges families may face, such as race, zip code, and different socioeconomic barriers to success? In one word, no. And that's sad because I wasn't expecting that. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, okay, so in a so in a perfect world where, you know, we're all professors and we work at universities or we work at K through 12 institutions, we want to believe that education is perfect and that children will, you know, all children will grow up in an educational system that's going to be edifying and supportive. That's just not the case. You know, uh, you can go to the best schools in this country and I put best in quotes and still not get portions of African-American history, Irish-American history, Chinese-American history. And it's so-called the best school. So we have to even start looking at what does that mean to be a good school? Does it mean a school that 
works on the theory of rote memory and then the children are just taught to pass a test or a school where the children are introduced to critical thinking. Mm. That's that's the difference. I mean, you really don't even need textbooks to teach. You can teach through storytelling. But mm. but when you but when you infuse profit into the system, now audio, video, textbooks are going to be created by a lot of companies who don't know anything about education, but their materials look beautiful. And if your materials look beautiful, it's easy to sell to a school system. Mm. Even though the even though the materials may be inferior. You know, we need to go back to the griots, man. If you are a griot, what in antiquity, the politicians knew to keep the poets close because if the people stop listening to the politician, they're going to listen to the poet because the poet can put it in a way that's appealing to the ear. <laughs> that's the yeah. difference. That's why hip hop is so popular because it's appealing to the ear, regardless of what the what the MC is saying. It's appealing to the ear. You hear that bass, and then you hear that MC, and it's like I'm, <laughs> I'm in. That's it. You know, I don't, I don't really care what he's saying, but I'm listening. Mm. You know, and 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 so we need to, you know, really education should be storytelling. Mm. It, it it shouldn't be really. Of course, there's aspects of rote memory that you have to have. You got to learn times tables. Okay, yeah, you do. You know, if you're if you want to be a chemist, you need to know what the periodic you know, table of, of elements is. Okay. Of course you need to know. Okay. So that's rote memory. If you're going to, if you're going to law school, there are certain cases that are precedent that you need to memorize. If you're going to med school, you need to, you need to pass anatomy, which is one of the hardest classes to pass in your first year of med or, or in your, in your, or in bio one in undergrad, you got to pass anatomy because you got to know every muscle, every fiber, every bone, every tendon in the body. So, okay, so rote memory is important, but what do you do once you know the rote? After that, you have to think. Mm. That's what's beautiful, man, about uh, trauma surgeons. You go to a trauma, you go to a hospital in Chicago that's, a, that's, that's got a trauma ER. And mm. at, so when, when a trauma surgeon goes to work, they know they're going to get trauma, but they don't know what. Oh, gunshot wound to the calf. Oh, gunshot wound to the growing. Oh, surface wound to the skull. You got to patch it up. You got to save a life. Mm -hmm. You know, and if only every living person on a day to day basis could think the same way as a trauma surgeon. Mm -hmm. Because in essence, that's what we all are. We're all trauma surgeons, man, in our own ways. Are you are you building the building or are you tearing it down? Hmm. Mm. Never heard it like that. Yep. So now, what did you think about the No Child Left Behind Act? On paper and in theory, brilliant. The way it was carried out, horrible. Um, basically, it was written on the premise that every child should be able to read to master numeracy and literacy by third grade, okay? That's mm -hmm. the basic premise of it. And that every school within a five-year period should be brought to a level four or level three school to a level one, all right? Uh, that every child would be able to graduate by the age of 18. These are some of the tenets of No Child Left Behind. Did it succeed? Basically, no. So what came <laughs> out of what came out of No Child Left Behind was the charter school movement, which basically was built by corporations that wanted to make that wanted to make money off of public dollars. Mm -hmm. So, so if I'm a business, how can I get public money? Well, I just can't take the public money, but I can build a product and offer mm -hmm. to public schools. And if they buy the product, I can get tax dollars from everyday individuals. Mm -hmm. and so, so from No Child Left Behind, we get the charter school movement. And, you know, don't get me wrong. 
Some charter schools do great work. Some charter schools do horrible work. Most charter schools are no better or no worse than the average traditional public school. And there was just this big explosion of, of charter schools. It's funny that you mentioned that, but I, I don't think most of us pay attention to those things. That's right. That's right. And you know, if you and if you look at who backs who who's backing the charter schools monetarily, you know, you you follow the money and you'll see what's up. I mean, you know, and you know, none of us are innocent. You know, I built several charter schools. You know, uh, mm. but they were in areas where people needed the charter schools. So right. uh, 2003, 2005, built 21st Century Charter School. My brother, Theodore, and I were the founding board members of 21st Century Charter School in Gary, Indiana. We also uh, were the founding board members of Gary Middle College. And uh, I was also an advisor to 21st Century Charter School in Indianapolis and in Denver, Colorado. You know, this is this is back in the early 2000s. You know, we did some good work. We're still doing good mm -hmm. work. In fact, 21st Century Charter School in Gary, uh, you can take college courses at the charter school while you're in high school. In fact, we yeah, had great. we had several students get bachelor's degrees from Purdue while in high school. Yeah, see, I didn't have that in high school. That's not fair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. You're right. It's not fair. Yeah. What a big leap. Like, like, wow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's great. I'm glad that they're doing that. You know, because I feel like it's more competitive now more than ever. So it's important for them to get prepared as soon as they can. Yeah, truly, 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 truly. And the war, you know, time waits for no one, man. I mean, if 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 you don't have an entrepreneurial skill or a trade skill or high intellect critical thinking, you in trouble. It is that time, doctor. I'm going to let you go ahead. Yes, go ahead, preach. You're in trouble because here's the real deal. In a lot of black neighborhoods, you don't get introduced to algebra to ninth or 10th grade. In some wealthy neighborhoods, they introduce students to algebra in fourth, fifth, or sixth grade. So see, here's the thing. Math isn't something that you should be introduced to at in a particular grade. You can introduce trigonometry to a seven-year-old. Mm -hmm. You really can. Be, and here's the crazy part. A seven-year-old can't handle algebra, calculus, trig. Yeah, they can handle the more rudimentary forms of it. You know, we don't see that's the problem with America. We try to introduce people to stuff too late. Like, oh, OK, you're in, <laughs> you're, you know, you're in seventh grade now. It's time for you to learn another language. <laughs> you should have introduced me to French when I was four years old. OK, so of course I can speak a little French. I took French in middle school, high school and college. OK, fine. So I can. So Gerard can speak French. Right. You know, voulez-vous de sandwich du vin des fruits? Ce sont très bon marché. OK, so, you know, so I can order food so I can do this. So I can do that. OK, fine. But what if I would have learned German, French, Spanish when I was four? Yeah, I would have had all those languages mastered before the age of eight. Yeah. But, but stupid America. Oh, just wait till they're seventh, then seventh grade, and then they can start learning languages. That's that's stupid. And and it, and and here's the thing: it becomes exponentially horrible in black and brown communities because they don't think we can do anything anyway. And then they introduce us to something that we could master that we even invented. They introduce it to us too late. Mm. 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 You know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, doctor, we would like to thank you for coming on the show today. It has been a great privilege and honor. Myself and Yash really, really, really do appreciate this. Make sure drive riding down 79. It's Friday night. All the girls are looking right.